Welcome everyone. As everyone gets launched in here to Zoom, we have probably a record number of registrants for this uh, webinar and with good reason. Uh, we have Ryan Kim too here and they are fantastic at explaining these issues, is so passionate and experienced. Okay, well, I'm going to get to our quick intro slides, um, and please let us know if you have any questions. Um, I'll start running through that so we can get to your content. Uh, welcome. I'm Christina Clayton. I'm one of the co-directors of the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Uh, that's a long way of saying we do training and technical assistance, and we're here to support you with all free content, very thoughtful, um, amazing presenters like Brian today. Uh, and today's webinar is uh, titled Queer and Trans Youth Mental Health, Trauma-Informed and Anti-Racist Co-Conspiratorship with Ryan Kim Too. And they are fantastic at this content and will absolutely blow your minds with all of their uh, insights and experience. So first we do want to start with our land acknowledgement. However, I know in this virtual world, uh, it's maybe a little uh, informal to say, oh, we're doing a land acknowledgement, we're in a Zoom meeting, but it's really important to us uh, that we think about and reflect on the lands uh, where we reside and where we work and acknowledge all the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous peoples who've been here since time immemorial. And our motive for doing this is to just take at least one moment to acknowledge and pay respect to the nations whose homelands were forcibly taken over and inhabited. And we always want to do better to be better stewards of these lands through action, advocacy, support, and education. And we'll put a chat link um, about a fantastic resource from Native Land if you want to learn more about the lands where you live and work. A little bit about the MHTTC network. So we are a nationwide network supported by SAMHSA or Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And we include 10 regional centers, a National American Indian Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, and a network coordinating office. And there are also networks similarly for addiction and prevention using the same structure. And we do resource development, dissemination, training and TA, workforce development for the mental health field, but pretty much most people probably are working around mental health. So everybody is welcome. We specifically sit in region 10, which includes Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, but like these events, anyone is welcome to our webinars and those sort of things. A little bit more about our specific uh, center. We are housed in the University of Washington in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And our goals are similar to the network is to accelerate the adoption and implementation of best practices, to heighten awareness, knowledge, and skills, foster alliances, and address training needs of our diverse partners, and ensure we have free of delivery of public available training and TA. Our area of focus for the network in our center uh, is uh, serious mental health issues such as psychosis, so evidence-based practices for that. However, we provide a myriad of topics that are not specific to that, including integrated care, suicide prevention, diversity and equity inclusion issues, school mental health, peer support, trauma-informed, and others. And we do that through webinars, free online courses, uh, different newsletters and other announcements and resource library. And so we have a podcast also, so you can learn any way that you like. We, as a network, agreed that we would share this slide because we always want to be thinking about using affirming and respectful and recovery-oriented language in the work that we do and being mindful that, you know, no matter what the topic, there are different perspectives that may come up in these events. We just ask that you communicate using language that's respectful, not judgmental, inclusive, and accepting of all the diverse cultures, genders, abilities, and experiences. Uh, some folks tend to be very active in the chat. Some people find it distracting. Feel free to look, don't look, turn off the auto show, you know, um, but it can be a very vibrant place to communicate and get to know each other too. So feel free to use that. Um, speaking of logistics, uh, you are muted and off camera because there are almost 700 people right now. Um, it is being recorded and you have the option to use closed captioning. We will share the video recording and slides and send instructions on how you can get a certificate of attendance. It's not formal CEs, but it's something that might be applicable for you. For today, if you can please use chat for technical issues, if you need our team's help, team being me and our fabulous program manager, Gabriel Orsi in the background, share your comments or greetings or observations, or if one of these polls didn't have an answer that fit for you, please feel free to chat that in. 
If you have questions for the presenter, Ryan will be taking those questions near the end of their presentation. And so I will be monitoring the Q&A box to make sure that those questions get queued up for them. Please note, if you put a question in the chat, I can't copy and paste it into q and I don't know why. Um, and the Q&A should really be reserved for content questions for, for Ryan. So thank you so much for your help. A couple of things. We have a disclaimer here from SAMHSA because obviously they give us funding. They do not have in-depth knowledge about all the content we're going to share. So just uh, sharing that. They don't have an official position on that, but, but I know these issues are crucial. And lastly, your feedback is really important to our work. So if you could please do the one to two minute survey at the end, it really helps us know if this topic and presenter uh, did what we hoped it would do, or if you had something you'd like to recommend for a future event, uh, we'll share that link um, in the chat, probably near the top of the hour. And then before we go, and you'll get an email reminder as well. We are required to do the survey, but please know it is confidential. We don't know who said what, but it really helps people like Ryan and myself to to plan and think about how this went for you. So I think at this point, uh, Gabriel, we are going to show the poll results, very high uh, number of people participating. So um, before we get into talking with Ryan, let's see who's here today. All right. I can't tell if you are seeing, Ryan, can you give me a thumbs up or thumbs down if you can see results? Okay, awesome. <laughs> As a special host, I never know what I'm seeing if that's what you can see. So quite a variety of, yeah, 35% other. That's a problem. We only have limited numbers, um, but quite a number of uh, kinds of roles and settings and uh, very excited to, to catch up on in the chat about um, where else you are working, what else you are doing. All right. And you can close that out if you don't want to watch that anymore. But I am very, very grateful to have here today Ryan Kim Tu. They are a licensed clinical social worker and associate director of transgender services at the San Francisco Community Health Center, a community uh, and department within a larger health center staffed by and for transgender people providing mental health, health care and advocacy services for queer and transgender community members. In conjunction with their professional expertise, Ryan incorporates their lived experiences as a first generation immigrant, queer, transgender and young person of color into their praxis training and theories of change. And I'll just say, I'm especially grateful, Ryan, you did a webinar for us about a year plus ago, and no doubt that today was going to be uh, incredibly powerful um, and popular. So with that, I will let you take it away. I'll be in the background and thank you so much everyone for, for making time for this uh, topic today. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, let me share the screen here. Okay, everybody see that? Yep. Okay, perfect. Oh, there's so many people in the Zoom. I'm gonna try not to think about it. <laughs> um, okay, good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. My name is Brian. I use they, them pronouns, and I am an LCSW based out of San Francisco. I love receiving training and providing training on queer and trans mental health issues because it is uh, a field that is constantly evolving. There's always new information every time I come to update this presentation. Outside of my work, um, I'm a proud cat, dog, and plant dad. So apologies in advance if you hear them today. Um, and I'm a, an, a Pisces Aries cusp that loves to stay at home and make bread. So I am sure folks are familiar with the term allyship, uh, which is defined generally as being supportive to another person or group. We're moving towards calling this co-conspiratorship, which takes allyship a few steps further. Co-conspiratorship really emphasizes action, specifically being able to weaponize your privileges to take on risks that people without those privileges cannot to enact social change. So, I hope that you can absorb this information and use it to better the lives of trans people, clients, and the trans communities around you. And here are our very ambitious goals for today. And my hope with this webinar is to give you the tools to start and continue the conversations that are important for queer and trans youth mental health. The overarching goal today is for you all to leave with more knowledge, skills, and tools to be better providers and better supporters for trans young people. 
You will not be trans competent by the end of this training. Sorry to break it to you, uh, but this is really meant to be a springboard uh, for you to jump into your own self-reflection, education, and co-conspiratorship with trans communities. Um, what you'll find today is that trans youth mental health is closely intertwined with the relationship structures and symptomolo symptomology of the environment around us. So it makes sense to treat the individual by alleviating the symptoms of racism, transphobia, and discrimination that all impact the mental health of trans communities. I like to imagine a world where instead of diagnosing people that we also can diagnose culture and diagnose society and look at interventions to address all the isms that contribute to mental unwellness. So today we'll start with the basics, going to some of the history that has led up to what we're seeing today, we'll talk about race and gender, use specific care, our current political landscape. I think there's about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A, so write your questions down. Uh, we have a lot to cover today, and thank you also for, for sharing some of the specific topics that you're interested in. I included as much as I could in today's presentation. So before we start, I want you to think about, uh, think back to your first memory of when you realized what your gender is. And I do this because everyone, no matter what your gender is, has experience with gender. You know, trans people are often highlighted to speak on these experiences, but the reality is we should all be able to answer the questions that we are asking. How old were you when you first realized that you were the gender that you were. Now, the gender binary is a systemic classification that assumes a role you will play based on your sex assigned at birth. Essentially, it puts you in a box and restricts you to it. The two options based on the marker are based on the markers male and female. In many cultures outside of this country, the gender binary does not actually exist. And there are cultures where trans people are considered sacred members of society. The idea of the binary is so deeply rooted in our society, however, that it causes much of the discrimination and mental turbulence experienced by trans people. Transphobia itself is fueled by the dissonance caused by anything outside of the gender binary. Gender is the socially constructed characteristics and identities of women, men, trans, and non-binary people. The genders expressed inside this binary specify what men are supposed to look like, speak like, and be like, and conversely, what women are supposed to look like, speak like, and be like. This is greatly influenced by societal and cultural contexts. So when you think about the construction of your own gender, think about how you came to know to perform it. And this includes um, you know, the internal sense of who you are, as opposed to physical characteristics, genes, or hormones. Uh, in our country, in America, gender and sexual diversity historically was constructed um, as a disease or as a mental illness. So we do have that history. Many of y'all are familiar with the gender unicorn. It's been out for almost a decade. Uh, it's a great resource for guiding gender exploration for yourself or your clients. This was created in 2014 by Trans Student Educational Services, and it evolved from um, the Genderbred Man, which was created around 2010. I believe that was modified to the unicorn to better portray the distinction between gender, sex assigned at birth, and sexuality, but also be more body inclusive. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go over each part of this just in the interest of time, but I always have these printed out on my desk in case, you know, I have clients that are new to the conversation. So contrary to popular belief, biological sex itself is not binary. Even within the spectrum of genitals, let's say that people who have penises are a one, and people who have vaginas are a 10. You can have genitals that are like a five or a six. There are chromosomal variations like XXX or trisomy. Trisomy is also referred to being quote unquote super female which is very interesting considering people who have these kinds of chromosomes are considered intersex as they can have a myriad of what we typically consider male secondary sex characteristics, the Adam's apples or chest hair. There's also triple Y 
And any combination of one to three X and Y chromosomes that can result in no phenotypic variation to vast and diverse phenotypic variation. Some people who are assigned male at birth may have extremely high estrogen levels or vice versa. Someone who is assigned female at birth might have an over, overproduction of, of testosterone. And that's totally normal and actually common. Uh, people who vary with chromosomes, hormones, and genitals in this capacity are uh, more common than you think. And regarding pronouns, you know, just ask instead of assume, um, be intentional about when and where you ask, especially when it comes to trans youth. Um, youth who are not out to their parents may only use a certain name or pronoun at certain times. I found it helpful to ask, you know, what name would you like me to use for you? And is there a different name that I should use outside of the space or when I'm talking to your parents, for example? Hey, Ryan, I am so sorry to interrupt, but we've had a few people type in that it's a little hard to hear you. I don't know. I know you have a headset. I don't know if you have a microphone that can be closer. I have this lovely podcast microphone. Not everyone has one of those. So if there's any chance to do that, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. This is this better? A I little think, better? I think it's probably different for everybody, but yes, any, uh, okay. any way to do it. Thank you so much. I, people are saying yes. That's great. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to be really close to my computer. (laughs) (laughs) Very, very close. (laughs) Okay. Yes. All right. So Alok is a great resource for trans discourse. I really recommend following them on Instagram. Um, Gender and sex are actually cultural and geographically specific ways of organizing people and society. Western gender categories were developed as a metric to really demonize black communities and quote unquote, civilized white people. They, these are historically race specific categories central to the dehumanization of black people in early American history. The 19th century was around the time sex dualism became a dichotomy. Scientists in that era argued that white people were superior because of their ability to display a visual difference between men and women while black, indigenous, and other people of color were regarded as sex indistinguishable. So they considered a, quote, stronger contrast between men and women to be indicative of a higher development of race. Gender then was used to enforce ideas of civilized versus uncivilized. And these definitions were justifications to denying rights for not only black and brown communities, but also women in general. In many cultures outside of the United States, uh, gender looks very different before European colonization. Um, Indigenous Yoruba culture, for example, acknowledged distinct reproductive roles without using them to establish social hierarchy. The primary feature of social hierarchy actually centered age and not gender. But after European colonization, the new authority only recognized male leaders and refused to acknowledge female chiefs, despite the fact that women had long participated in political and public life in Yoruba culture. So forcible assimilation into Western patriarchy meant that over time, women had less access to education, less access to leadership roles, less access to economic independence, which is probably sounding familiar to how we see gender disparities play out here in the United States. Gender was and is a tool used to further racism. And this is why the deconstruction of the sex binary is critical to anti-racist work and anti-racist work is critical to the liberation of trans people. And this is apparent in the greater literature as well, because we know that trans and queer youth, youth of color are disproportionately impacted and under-resourced compared to our white counterparts. LGBT youth of color are more likely to have a conduct, di- uh, conduct disorder diagnosis, more likely to experience social isolation and experience family rejection. The 2015 National Trans Survey is one of the most comprehensive reviews of trans experiences in healthcare and mental health care. They just closed a survey last month for a 2022 update, which should be coming out sometime this year. But the 2015 version is available for free on their website in so many different languages, and it's 
uh, a resource that's often cited in trans discourse. So I highly recommend you save a PDF from USTransSurvey.org. Um, and this survey found that many trans people, especially black and brown trans people, have a really bad time accessing healthcare. Uh, unfortunately, these are really common experiences in trans communities, regardless of you know, whether or not you are insured. So according to NPR, um, over 306 bills have been introduced over the last two years targeting trans people with about 86% of these targeting trans youth, which is more than we typically see. And while only 15% of these bills have become law, the truth is that it is an increasingly hostile environment for trans youth across the country. And regardless of the bill's pass, they already have a negative impact for queer youth in contributing to a sense of hopelessness, misinformation, and fear. Most of these bills try to restrict access to gender-affirming care for trans youth, but some also target things like bathroom access, inclusion in sports, and even um, discussing gender identity in school curricula. A few relevant cases today are in Utah. I just signed a bill um, called SB 16, which bans blockers and other forms of gender affirming care. Um, Utah also has a few bills in the works banning youth from legally changing their gender markers on birth certificates. We're seeing similar bans as well in South Dakota, um, where they're you know also banning gender affirming care for youth, but they're also um, doctors who provide the care by revoking their medical licenses. Um, Texas has a couple bills that aims to classify gender affirming care to youth as a form of child abuse that would justify CPS investigations into parents who let their children receive gender affirming care. Uh, one of the more severe cases is in Oklahoma, uh, where they are trying to ban gender affirming care for patients, uh, not just under the age of 18, but under the age of 26, um, and also ban gender for my care from being covered under state Medicaid. Um, and another one that you may have heard about in the news is in Indiana, where they introduced Bill 354, uh, requiring uh, school districts to notify parents if their child has expressed any sort of gender exploratory behavior like wanting to use a different name or showing up in different clothes that are inconsistent with their sex assigned at birth, uh, which is an issue because they're uh, you know, outing youth to their parents who may not know uh, about the situation. Um, a lot of these bills were in introduced within the last month. Um, so this is a very, very current, very current issue. Uh, but, you know, in more uplifting news, trans youth are fighting back. Um, they are informed. They know their rights. They are working with many advocacy groups like the ACLU and the Trans Law Center, um, just to name a few good resources on this. Um, studies have shown, actually, that youth frequently engage in extensive research prior to discussing hormone therapy to anyone in their lives, and most youth seek parental support prior to accessing care. Um, I think something unique about this generation is that you know, we're growing up in an era where information is accessible in ways that it hasn't been before. And I think this is especially true in the recent years as we've you know, moved to an online world where you can go to school on Zoom and then at the same time have the enti entire internet at your fingertips 24-7. Uh, this is really set up young people to make change in ways that we've never seen before. And we see this um, not only with trans health, but we see this with you know, youth advocacy against gun violence, against police brutality, and against climate change. A uh, few trans youth who have been in the national spotlight are Gavin Grimm, who sued his school board in Virginia for restricting his bathroom access, but also for refusing to change his documentation even after he went through the legal uh, name and gender marker change process. And after four years of litigation, they ruled in his favor. 
in 2020. We also have Jazz Jennings, um, who in 2007 became one of the youngest publicly documented people to be identified as, as trans at the age of seven, uh, where she quickly rose to fame after her interview on 2020. Um, shortly after she founded the Trans Kids Purple Rainbow Foundation to help trans youth. And lastly, Nicole Means, who is in the middle, um, she anonymously sued her school district in Maine also for restricting bathroom access. Um, the court ruled in 2014 that barring students from using the bathrooms consistent with their gender identities unlawful, which was the first time in the nation that had happened and really um, helped in setting the precedent for future cases like Gavin's. All right, we're going to transition to talking about transition related care. Okay, so it often involves moving away from sex assigned at birth to another gender. Transition is usually a lifelong process, um, but there's also a shift in the current language where folks are transitioning to ourselves instead of transitioning to male or transitioning to female. Um, it's a little bit more inclusive of non-binary identities, but also inclusive of the fluidity that transitioning can be. Um, I like to describe transition like a buffet you know, people can choose the order and amount and pathway of transition, and there's no right or wrong way to go about it. Gender nonconformity is really normal and natural. Um, according to the Trevor Project's 2020 report on Black trans mental health, uh, more than one in four Black LGBTQ youth use pronouns outside of he or she, and one in three Black LGBTQ youth identify as transgender or non-binary. There are a couple resources on the screen here. The clinician's guide is obviously more clinical um, and the reflective workbook is a great resource for parents and families of trans youth. There's also a version of this book for partners of trans people and teachers of trans students. And these are thick books. Uh, they're full of reflective exercises, guidance on navigating grief, tools you can use, uh, languaging. I'll also recommend the gender workbook uh, and the gender workbook specific for teens. And this is for youth who are navigating their own gender. So this is an excerpt from India Moore. She's in Pose, which is a Netflix series about the black and brown ball scene set in 1980s New York. Highly recommend watching this if you haven't already. So she's speaking about the non-necessity of surgical modification. Surgery is not something that every trans person desires. Um, it's usually expensive and it often comes with many barriers to access. Many trans people believe that they need to have surgery to be the gender that they are and that is simply not the case. The medical and mental health system have imposed these processes to access transition related care in a way that positions the trans person as the subject and the provider as the gatekeeper. And in order to get most gender affirmation surgeries and even hormones, people, uh, trans people are still currently required to see a mental health provider to get a mental health evaluation. And in these evaluations, the clinician's constructed responsibility is to determine if the individual's identity is stable and established, um, and if the individual is capable of making their own medical decisions. And we, we think of cisgender people who get these same surgeries, right? So like uh, hysterectomies, orchiectomies, mastectomies, mammoplasties, for example. Um, cisgender people do not have to go through a mental health evaluation to get the same surgeries. Um, and it is even more challenging for trans youth because in most states and health systems, um, they require parental support if you're under 18. If you have it, then it becomes much easier, but if you don't, then it becomes much, much harder. So there are three types of general need for mental health care uh, regarding transition. So there's the exploration of gender identity, coming out in social transition, and general mental health issues. Medical transition, like social and legal transition, are options to alleviate gender dysphoria. It's not a requirement to be transgender, but we know that for folks who want to medically transition, when they are able to, they report decreased anxiety, 
decreased social stress, better esteem, better mood, better quality of life. Uh, there are many kinds of gender affirmation surgery. The UCSF Trans Care Center is a great resource to educate yourself about them. In terms of languaging, you know, anything that ends in ectomy is removal of, and anything that ends in plasty is creation of. And we often refer to surgeries above the belt as top surgeries and below the belt as bottom surgeries. There are many interventions that are reversible and some that are irreversible. So for many young trans people, providers like to start with reversible interventions like hormone blockers and sometimes fertility preservation as well. Um, hormone blockers help delay unwanted physical changes, kind of like hitting the pause button on puberty. Um, so it'll slow things down like chest growth, facial hair growth, uh, periods, voice changes. There are some risks with it that should be discussed with a medical doctor, but nine times out of 10, the mental benefits outweigh the physical risks. Um, it's an option meant to give folks more time to consider other options. And it's pretty low commitment. You know, once you stop hormone blockers, the puberty of the sex assigned at birth moves forward. Social transition uh, includes, you know, trying different names, different pronouns, um, learning how to navigate public spaces differently. This is often the first step to transitioning that folks take. And this is where having mental health support can be really helpful. Um, and this is where trans folks are figuring out like, how to navigate their world, how to navigate their support networks and their relationships. For cultural transitions, it can include um, taking on the role of uh, like a son versus a daughter in your family. We know that in many Asian American families, for example, the roles and expectations change depending on whether or not you're the eldest or the youngest and, uh, and your gender. Social transition includes the process of um, coming out, which is the process of self-disclosure of gender or sexual identity. Folks are using letting in instead of coming out, which is a, a more recent language shift that reclaims the power to the individual. Um, letting in recognizes that sharing parts of ourselves is an invitation to be part of our lives. It's an act of trust and it's a demonstration of truth. Um, it's not a one-time event and it's not an event that is owed to anybody. Um, and being part of a trans person's life is a privilege that is not granted to many people. Um, I've found that this framework is particularly helpful for parents of trans children in becoming co-conspirators as well. Uh, there are often experiences of fear and anxiety for the future of trans youth because we know that the world is a scary place for trans people. But to teach a young trans person uh, what being loved and respected feels like is a great tool in modeling how they deserve to be treated. Legal transition is the process of changing your name and your gender marker. It is a state-specific state process. And I'd recommend going to uh, transequality.org slash documents to get the details on what your state allows. Um, the X or non-binary gender marker was allowed on state documents like um, driver's licenses starting in 2019. And it is the first option outside of the gender binary. This is also state dependent. Most states allow the X gender marker, but some states make it really hard to get it. I think there are like five or eight states that require uh, proof of surgery before you can uh, change it to X. Um, and since the last year, this was recently expanded to um, federal documents. So now you can get the X gender marker on uh, your passport, for example. So what about the parents? So for many of us that work with youth, you know, some of us are, we're a long ways from proceeding with any type of transition. You know, what do we do when we're working with youth who have unsupportive parental relationships? Uh, before I go into this, I wanna highlight uh, Gender Spectrum as a great resource for parents. They're a national organization based out of Oakland. Um, they have parent-facing groups as well as youth-facing groups, as well as training for school-based providers on this. Um, their approach to working with 
parents is this every lock has a key method. The overarching goal of this method aims to take steps towards supportive behaviors. So trying to crack the door open slowly instead of opening it completely and letting everything in at once. Um, there are a few exceptions to this, but gen generally we have to work with parents when it is safe to involve them. Um, the research shows that parental impact is substantial in youth mental wellness, access to resources, not just during childhood, but also it impacts the trajectory of wellness for their children for the rest of their life, really. Um, a few key tips here is honor the parent's desire for the child's well-being. Rejection and hesitation often stem from fear and lack of information, with the root being the desire to, to protect your child. Your other feelings that might come up are guilt, self-blame, and grief. The important thing to share is that parents have an impact on the lives of their children, whether or not they are supportive. And while they cannot control aspects of who someone is, they can control the impact that they have on their child, whether that's positive or negative. Second tip, um, emphasize the importance of thriving versus surviving in conversations that center worry about the potential for future happiness. Um, thriving for trans youth is much more attainable when they're living in their authentic selves. Um, at school, at work, and in relationships. Third tip, uh, being strengths-based. So in situations, this can sound like, hey, you know, the fact that your child felt safe enough to bring this up to you, um, that they felt safe enough to bring you into this part of themselves is, is very vulnerable. Um, that can be testament to the strength of the relationship. If the parent not, is not in that place, for example, if they like found out indirectly, then this can be presented as an opportunity to strengthen the relationship. Fourth tip, um, prioritizing relationship is key in cases where parents want to wait until the child is an adult to pursue transition. Um, you have to think about the cost of that on the parent-child relationship. And there are impacts on health and well-being, whether or not you move forward. Uh, the conversation can center how to protect the relationship in a way that doesn't cause irreparable damage. Um, and I like to say that relationships are like glass. They can be very fragile and sensitive to rupture. And my last tip uh, is to make gender accessible to, to parents. You know, what is their own gender experience? You know, we're in a time now where information is readily accessible and there are options for connecting with other parents of trans youth, um, going on online forums, accessing trans media. Um, and like I mentioned previously, everybody has some experience navigating gender, but most people are not giving, given the, pro the tools to process their own experiences. All right, chosen family is a very important survival tool, especially for black and trans youth and other trans youth of color. Um, ballroom culture is life-saving for many black and brown trans youth. Pose is a great representation of the ways that house culture, for example, is a form of chosen family. Um, houses usually have like a mother or a father figure, sometimes both. Uh, leading the other members who are referred to as children. Uh, they're meant to provide shelter, solace, and safety for those who don't receive that from their biological families. Um, we also see in the youth Kiki House of Juicy Couture, uh, who won season three of Legendary. They're on the top, the top right. Um, and uh, Legendary is a, it's a reality show exploring the world of ball culture on HBO. Um, that features trans young people on a national stage. It's not uncommon to see trans youth build chosen family systems, even if their biological families are supportive. Uh, there's a very unique sense of kinship that derives from trans marginalization. And it is so important for trans youth to have positive trans influences in their life.
Okay, so on to pathology and diagnosis. So the pathologization of queerness started with the very first DSM-1, where we see sexual deviation being the umbrella term to define all folks who are not straight and not cisgender. In the 1950s, which is around the same time the DSM-1 was published, Christine Jorgensen embarked on one of the first publicized medical transitions in history. And if you've heard of Christine, you might've heard um, that she used to be in uh, the army as well. And it's one of the reasons that she gained worldwide attention was because she had been a US service member before and really embodied the epitome of masculinity in a post-World War II America. So you can see the news would read like GI Joe, it's GI Jane, or XGI becomes one duty. These are all popular ways that the media publicized her story. Um, and you can see the binary systems of thinking here that are so prevalent to this, today's discourse. She actually had to go all the way to Europe to get gender affirming care because the medical community you know, the, in the US at the time was unwilling. Um, and you can uh, probably tell with the DSM-1 criteria that the interventions that followed were neither gender affirming or client-centered. Um, the diagnosis of homosexuality was removed by the DSM-2, which didn't come out until two decades after the DSM-1. The medical community in the US didn't start shifting until the mid 1960s, about 15 years after Christine gained international attention. Needless to say, she demonstrated to a lot of trans people that medical transition was possible. In fact, the Danish government banned gender affirming procedures for non-citizens after the influx of trans people who wanted to follow in her footsteps. Um, and while she paved the way for many trans people and inc incited transformation in the US medical community, she also inadvertently served as a template for the medicalization of trans people. And today we know that transitioning is like a buffet and gender is a spectrum with no set path. Uh, Christine's narrative was that she felt like she was trans at a young age, she was attracted to men and identified as heterosexual, and she was very conventional, conventionally feminine. And that's a very valid experience of transness. Many trans people share that story, but the medical community took this narrative and institutionalized uh, definition of trans people that was extremely rigid. Um, it became a prescriptive model instead of a descriptive model. Later in the 1960s, when John Hopkins University opened the first gender identity clinic in this country, they created criteria for transness as people who, quote, felt like they were in the wrong body, they were heterosexual, they had to know at an early age. And in fact, their criteria were so restrictive that a vast majority of trans people were turned away from these clinics. So if you identified as trans and gay, you were turned away. If you were a trans woman, but you didn't like to dress conventionally feminine, you were also turned away. And if you didn't know at a young age, uh, that was another reason for them to turn you away. So the rigidity of these criteria uh, really set the tone for trans care. And it still shows up today in our health and mental health systems. Uh, this contributes to the medical mistrust that exists in trans and especially black trans communities, especially when you think of the compounding history of medical experimentation on black communities, uh, bad experiences at the doctor are considered normal in the trans community. And we see this reflected in research uh, with about one third of trans people reporting at least one negative experience at the doctor related to being trans in the 2015 National Trans Survey. Marsha P. Johnson is one of the most key, well-loved and fundamental icons in trans history. She pretty much single-handedly uh, is responsible for creating uh, pride marches and had an effect on all LGBT rights today. There are many articles on the Stonewall riots in the late 60s, uh, but I'm gonna focus on the time period because the growing politicis politicization of transness in the mental health field happened around the same time. Uh, Marsha herself survived numerous 
psychiatric hospitalizations resulting from the discrimination and homelessness she endured as a Black trans woman. And despite this, she had a profound way of putting others' needs before her own and really helped bring the queer and trans liberation movement to a point where it impacted the mental health field as well. We often don't realize the ways that we've been taught to think and even speak about trans communities. And in order to be effective co-conspirators, we have to be very intentional about the language that we use and the way that we diagnose transness. Here's, here's the diagnosis of sexual deviance um, in the DSM-1. And the remnants of this rigidity still exist today, even though we're making some progress. Trans stories in the media focus around medical transition or tragedy and often centers white transness. Uh, Marsha P. Johnson, who we mentioned in the last slide, was about seven or eight years old when the DSM-1 came out. So transness was not quite a politicized identity yet. Um, and at the end of this uh, diagnosis, we see the conflation with gender and sexuality. We see that pedoph pedophilia was attached to transness as well, which is erroneous and also a projection. Trans people, especially youth, are actually more likely to be victims of sexual violence. And about one in two trans people experience sexual assault or intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Um, and despite this, you know, medical and mental health fields um, have rarely afforded trans clients with autonomy and trust in our own expertise. And the ways that the diagnostic models upholds the system looks like the fact that trans people still need to go through a pretty rigid mental health evaluation to access most gender affirming care. And in this model, there's practically no room for non-binary or gender fluid expressions. Um, if you're trans and you don't hate your body, uh, you have to still use the language of hating your body or experiencing dysphoria in order to get through that evaluation process. Um, one of the ways that we can combat this is to understand gender as diverse, not deviant, and speak about the experience of gender and not its pathology. Uh, when trans clients have to navigate a reality in which their humanity is constantly up for a debate, depression and anxiety become completely appropriate responses to just existing. Um, today in the DSM-5, we have the diagnosis of gender dysphoria here, marked in congruence between one's experienced gender and assigned gender of at least six months duration as manifested by at least two of the following, and I'm gonna list not all of the criteria here, um, but you can probably see that this diagnosis is also one that speaks to a narrative of self-loathing, a lot of unease and dissatisfaction with life. Um, and these experience are the experiences are valid and really common in trans communities, but dysphoria is not something that every trans person experiences. It's important to locate the movement and the source of dysphoria. There's a difference between uh, distress with yourself and distress as a result of other people's distress with you, or what's often called societal dysphoria. Uh, this refers to the discrimination and violence that occurs to trans people. The DSM-5 explicitly says that gender nonconformity is not in itself a mental disorder, but even then we still require the diagnosis to access gender affirming care. Um, this version of the DSM took out the trans diagnosis uh, out of the sexual disorders category and into a category of its own before renaming it, uh, before it was called gender identity disorder. Um, and the shifts in the DSM have changed the way that trans people utilize mental health resources, especially when it comes to transitioning. Uh, many trans people navigating mental health care still experience barriers due to providers using outdated standards of care. Remember that therapy is not a requirement, it's a recommendation. Um, follow the lead of your client, focus the conversation on their goals related to their life direction, their transition, and come from a place of curiosity. A language is always changing in our community, so mirror the language that your client uses. And in order to make sure that you're on the same page, you can ask, you know, if I've heard a lot of different definitions of this, what does this word mean to you? The International Guidelines for Trans Care, also called the, the WPATH Standards of Care, um, use what's called an informed consent model, which is an approach that allows for the tailoring of interventions to the needs of the individual receiving services. 
And this is a model meant to empower the individual and give them the choice to move forward or not after a discussion about the benefits and risks and alternative care. Um, you should also have discussions about the benefits and risks associated with not moving forward um, with transition after a mental health assessment. With trans youth, this is where we see the most impact. The WPATH standards of care have, uh, they have a section specifically on the risks of withholding medical treatment for trans youth who want to pursue medical treatment. Um, these risks include prolonging gender dysphoria, uh, contributing to an increased risk of abuse and stigmatization and psychiatric distress. Uh, trans people have taken this diagnosis of gender dysphoria and created what is called gender euphoria. So some things that we do to resist this narrative is make room for conversations for gender euphoria, uh, which are behaviors, expressions, spaces, and situations that are affirming to someone's gender expression. This can sometimes look like having facial hair or wearing makeup. It can look like um, falling in love, being gendered correctly. Trans, experience, trans experiences are extremely multi-layer. Uh, what often induces dysphoria in trans people is not always the fact of being trans, but rather the reaction to transness and gender variation from the world around us. Um, gender euphoria can look as simple as being supported by the people around you um, and experiencing gender dysphoria and joy with blood and chosen families is a great mental health intervention. So what does informed care mean? Trauma informed care is definitely uh, a buzzword, but what does it actually mean for trans mental health? Trauma is, trauma is often part of the picture, not in ways that are defined by the DSM. You know, we have um, PTSD, acute stress disorder uh, diagnoses, which focus on post-trauma approaches. But when the trauma is constant, which is common for trans people and trans youth, uh, we have to shift from focusing on diagnostic criteria to focus on the trauma impacting the expression and experience of gender. You know, when your rights are constantly up for debate you know, in different parts of the country and parts of the world, the experience of trauma can feel very normal to trans communities. Trauma-informed care also assumes that an individual is more likely than not to have a history of trauma. And that means as providers, we have a responsibility to respond to the effects of trauma at all or from the experience at the front desk to the experience sitting in a therapy chair. And to do this in a way that was healing recovery. Okay, so we are close to the end and you're asking yourself, what do I do with all of this information? You are all the authority figures in the lives. Ryan. Hi. Oh, Sorry. okay. <laughs> no, I'm sure we broke the internet with this webinar. Please, please continue. Okay, okay. I'm like on my second to last slide too. I think this also happened last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you are all the authority, authority figures in the lives of many, since you have a rare opportunity to advocate for familial acceptance, to teach others what I showed you today, um, to talk to people about supporting and leading by example, and educating others as much as possible about the disparities that trans young people are facing. Starting this dialogue is life-saving for a lot of people. Um, and I hope y'all are feeling a little bit more confident about being able to start them. Um, and just to summarize what we talked about today, so we've gone over some of the basics. Uh, we talked about transitioning, diagnoses, um, advocacy for trans clients through medical, social, and legal transition. We talked about uh, ballroom culture, Marsha P. Johnson, Christine Jorgensen, um, both pivotal figures in trans activism and trans care. And there's so, so much more that we can go into with all of these topics. Um, but I hope that you enjoyed my introductory spiel. Woo, Ryan, that is so much information. And I've heard you share this before, and it is still, I, I 
digest more every time. And it's not over. Um, I know some people might need to leave for the top of the hour, but we do have some time to do um, some questions that folks have shared. Um, so let me get to that. <clears throat> Are there resources Ryan recommends some of what they're saying around co-development of race and gender constructs is new to me. So before you answer, if you want to email us some resources, I'm aware that people have been putting things into the chat. We uh, will try to do our best to grab things from your slides. I've been collecting some links, but if you have something you want to share um, or you want to email us a link, please, uh, however you'd like to answer. Yeah, there's uh, books that I can send for this, specifically okay. with uh, race and gender and how they've developed together. Excellent. Great. Great. Um, and also with those resources, I'll include uh, somebody had a, a very poignant question about, you know, not being able to talk about some of these issues when doing presentations. And we do know as a network, as universities, as different places, you know, I'm coming from a very privileged place, not just as a white cisgendered woman, but also working in a Northwest university and having a lot of privilege to uh, host this event, you know, whereas this, this event may not be allowed in, in certain places, which is just, you know, horrible, but um, we'll also include some of the larger national resources and some other great uh, sources of information as, uh, along with what Ryan has shared. Um, cause there, there's a whole center that SAMHSA funds on this very issue. And, uh, so yeah. Okay. Uh, someone asks, uh, I struggle with the gender binary as a child, because as a girl, I wanted to do all the things my brothers could do. I just heard a story yesterday about a girl going, uh, being part of the boy scouts because the girl scouts weren't offering the things she was interested in. So the question is, uh, around societal norms and gender norms, how do we reconcile the difference between being non-binary and not subscribing to gender norms? And I'm pretty sure you have a, an answer for that. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I like to think about transness, gender, and queerness in a way that is less concrete and more constructive. So I, I like to say, um, instead of like, how are we conforming to gender? I like to say, uh, how are we creating gender as we experience life? Um, we hear this a lot with trans clients, um, at least from what I see, there's a lot of um, like fear about not being trans enough or um, not fitting exactly with the mold of what folks expect you know, a woman to look like or a man to look like, or even a non-binary person to look like. But the approach of, you know, how are you creating this identity of queerness? How are you identity, creating this identity of transness as you are living it um, is a more, I think, like productive and generative conversation. Mm, always such great insights. Can you, another a question, can you speak to the overlap between uh, autism spectrum disorders and transgender identification. Uh, this person works in the IDD field and see that intersection a lot. I don't know if that's something you have experience with, but if you can shed any light, that would be great. Mm -hmm. So this is actually something that we see a lot, uh, the overlap between folks who are neurodivergent and folks who identify as trans. Um, in these intersections, I've found that uh, transness is often like, um, it's a way of experiencing the world and a way of seeing the world that is very, very colorful. It's very different. Um, and I see autism in a similar way. I think that's why there is an overlap. Um, there's very specific like resources related to this that I can send. But generally what I like to do is to like talk about how they see the world and explore that from a, the stance of being trans, but also the, stand of, the stance of being uh, neurodivergent. Well, and just that example of different terms right there, you know, is such a, you know, I'm, I'm mildly familiar with the, you know, IDD terminology, and then you kind of switch to neurodivergent, which I also heard a lot. Um, and so thank you for that reframe. Mm -hmm. Another question, how can we talk or can we talk about how schools, specifically higher education, uh, has both celebrated and failed transgender students? And is this coming from the culture or the policies, perhaps? Um, do with that what you will. So I think it's coming from both the culture and the policies. 
Um, there's so much unlearning that we have to do in these systems uh, as administrators who like maybe are creating these policies. Um, in addition to the learning that has to happen with the information that's always changing. Um, I think that, you know, there's so much room to grow with higher ed, but we saw this, I think, I would say more in the last five to 10 years when transness really started becoming like a national conversation and equity started becoming a national conversation. But, you know, I think it's a process. I think that students are really spearheading the need. They're doing a lot of advocacy on the, um, just like the student, the student end. And we're seeing a lot of results from that. Yeah. Well, and of course, now everyone has more questions. Um, so I'm just, I'm sorry, Ryan, we're going to have to have you back. <laughs> There's just no way. We thought we were going to break our Zoom room. So we we were able to switch that. I, I apologize for anyone that's watching this that couldn't get into the new Zoom room because we will start with the largest one um, next time we have you. But I think, you know, perhaps a learning community, not to put you on the spot, but I feel like, you know, people want to interact with you and want to really, they're asking questions about how do I do this differently or how do I uh, advance this or, or put this in it? Cause every, every question is asked you, you have amazing um, insights and, and offerings. So another question, how do you address parents that state they believe their child is trans because of overexposure to media and made them think they are, I've heard this myself and I have some pretty liberal circles. Um, uh, it, it, it's sort of, well, now that people are talking about it somehow, put the idea in someone's head. Mm -hmm. I've heard this a lot too. I think that uh, we are seeing more and more young people explore gender, right? More than I think we have ever before. I think that because of the way information is accessible uh, is one of the reasons. I don't think that there were less trans people like before media was a big thing. I think that... Um, we just have more visibility. The world feels a lot smaller uh, with the internet at our fingertips. Um, and it seems like there's more trans people like coming out, but I think that's a good thing. I think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, so just awareness mm -hmm. doesn't mean suddenly the uh, these issues uh, just appeared, uh, right? And, and that's just a pretty uh, false way to sort of look at that. Um, Okay. Oh my gosh. Um, so some of these are a little bit related support groups. Uh, obviously not everyone's in California like yourself, um, but recommended for families experiencing a transition with their child and also ways to support uh, trans youth when the, that family or parents are not supportive. Mm -hmm. And again, you might have these resources you're writing in a send us, but um, just in case. Yeah. So I really, I really do recommend gender spectrum. They have uh, mm -hmm groups for parents, they're all remote. You can join from okay. any part of the country. Great, okay. Um, for folks who wanna to talk to other parents. And the second question, supporting trans youth when parents and family are not supportive. Um, this is always hard because sometimes the only opportunity for that person to talk about these issues is in that hour that they have with you in that week or maybe like uh, in that month. Um, and I like to look at you know, what are ways to exist in the reality that you're currently in that doesn't require your par parents or your family. Um, video game therapy is really helpful for trans youth, especially because you can like the characters that you can create can be of any gender. They can be they can look like anything. Um, so finding spaces even online where they can show up as their authentic selves is a good uh, outlet when their reality is not one that can support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh my gosh, questions keep coming in. Um, how about uh, something I hadn't seen brought up uh, before, so I'm sorry I'm jumping around. Can you talk a little bit about how to manage or discuss internalized transphobia? You know, I think we've certainly talked in the field about internalized racism, internalized homophobia. Um, how does that show up in, in the work that you do or you, you see? That's such a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the rest of them have been simple. 
<laughs> yeah, <sighs> yeah. So I think internalized transphobia, I touched a little bit on this earlier, is the it's really the idea that transness looks a certain way and it has to um, like follow a certain path. Um, it also looks like, you know, the way that shows up is the lack of self-acceptance, a lot of self-doubt when you're not following what you think you should be following. Um, and it just causes a lot of like dysphoria, but also uh, hopelessness and um, isolation sometimes when folks feel like they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, internalized transphobia, I think uh, ACT, acceptance commitment therapy, I think is something that's really helpful for those cases. Um, but also like meeting other trans people, talking to other trans people and witnessing the diversity of trans experience and realizing that is uh, that's something that is really unique to the trans community that should be you know celebrated, not um, like disregarded in that sense. Here's um, another kind of different question, but it relates to, you know, I think the idea of trans youth who are pursuing, you know, uh, hormone replacement therapy or procedures or, you know, postponing puberty um, and those development of characteristics that, you know, when people uh, sort of realize as an adult, they, they didn't have that choice, you know, and how horrible, if you've ever seen any documentaries or read any books about that process, that can be just a very terrible experience. So to prevent that trauma of having something that does not match who you feel you are inside, then parents are worried they might change their mind and what's going to happen if they do that. Can you speak to that a little bit? Mm -hmm. So the idea of detransitioning uh, is certainly a thing. It's not common, um, but that's why when they're young with like blockers starting with that yeah. is usually a good option it is totally yeah. totally reversible mm -hmm. um and really the experience of transition like um like i mentioned about it being like a buffet is that sometimes gender changes and sometimes like you find that um you want to take hormones for a certain period of time you get what you were looking for and then you stop and that's okay too you know um, I think those sorts of changes and that sort of fluidity is part of the buffet of transition. And it's not something that is uh, like inherently bad. Well, uh, and here's another question. Um, uh, someone does have a question about use of pronouns. And um, I think we have some links that... Uh, I found potentially, or you might have that we could include, um, but this question, and I think this is an interesting one. I mean, they've all been interesting, but you know, what about um, if you are identifying as non-binary is not considered trans enough? Um, they're pushed to make a decisions. Uh, my teen faces this. I think that's probably, you know, uh, even in, you know, those terms, you know, gay, straight, or male, female, all these binary constructs. And now we're, not, we're really talking about everything in between. Um, and, you know, feeling pressure, perhaps as a youth that, well, this isn't really trans, or this isn't really, you know, like, how, what do you see youth um, sort of struggling with that? Yeah, I think this is one of the reasons why folks are starting to say that they're transitioning to themselves not transitioning to male, not transitioning to female, mm -hmm. uh, because transition does look differently for, every, for everybody. And gender is so defined by your culture and your race that it doesn't always fit in a linear way into male or female. All right. Um, how about, you know, we're, we're almost out of time, but we might, we might, as long as people don't keep adding questions, <laughs> there are, they keep adding them. Um, Cause they're so riveting when we we're listening to you before. Um, how would you recommend to assist a uh, trans youth um, experiencing gender euphoria when they aren't, um, you know, sharing that with parents or not supported, maybe they can't dress or physically express. I imagine you're going to say there might be connections, you know, via the World Wide Webs. Um, but, uh, you know, how else do you support uh, 
the positives, which I think, you know, you led with and have said in the last time as well, that we don't talk about enough about um, not just that it'll get better, but there are amazing things uh, about these communities and identifying and being on that journey. Um, how do you support that euphoria for people who are maybe not able to in a, a more uh, outward way? Mm -hmm. So I've had youth join support groups from like their literal closet. Like they'll be like on their phones in our closet because that's the only way that they can get what they need, right? And sometimes that's what you have to do to get what you need. Um, but the internet is a great place for, you know, exploring gender in this way, especially when your environment is not supportive of gender. Um, TikTok is a good place to have these conversations. There's like, I'm on TikTok a lot, but there's like videos, but also TikTok lives where people can interact with each other um, and trans people are usually on TikTok live um, talking about their experiences or like hosting a forum where people can talk to each other. And these are all things that you can do from your phone with your headphones on without anybody like knowing what you're doing. Um, but you know, if, yeah, what is it? The phrase is like, if you'll find a way, you will find a way, yeah. You know, it, kind of back to that um, suggestibility comment, I just have to throw in um, my personal experience and professional experience working with a lot of folks um, early on in my career, uh, serving folks um, in trans and queer communities, working with folks that really were patient and educated me. Um, I did a lot of my own research and reading and watching and um, no, no, claims of expertise at all. Uh, but in having a colleague transition and uh, his children, um, I think called him a transformer. <laughs> and, um, and I remember having this conversation with my own kids, like trying to explain, we went to a party as a work party and there were all sorts of folks at the party. And so it was such a good conversation to have with my kids around what does this mean? Why does this person not have a pronoun? This person's identifies as this way. Um, and to think that one could be suggested into pursuing what is obviously a very risky way of being in the world. That's what sort of blows my mind is that people just may not appreciate the gravity and depth of work that comes to, like you are saying, that first time you share perhaps a different pronoun with a provider, that this isn't an overnight thing you heard in a commercial and you, uh, you know, th these are like lives and your life and others who, um, it's just, it's a really serious and empowering thing, but it's nothing that people take lightly. And so if anyone thinks that, I just think that's where I, I would want to make make sure that's very clear. That's not true. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. We will certainly try and ask Ryan in some email and hopefully you can get back to us with some, some ideas or resources. I thank everybody for hanging in there. Um, we are probably just going to go ahead and skip the rest of our slide. We don't have anything that's this important, but Ryan, we have to have you back. That's just, that's all there is to it. So, um, <laughs> cause you have nothing else going on, no jobs or family or other demands, but thank you everybody for being here. If you aren't getting our uh, newsletter and announcements for trainings, um, you'll hopefully can find that on our website and, um, we wish everybody a safe journey and uh, we'll hope to see you back, Ryan. And thank you everybody for being here. The people are, are, are speaking in the chat. They love it. They want more and, and we will provide more. So thank you so much for your time.